Yes. So Rob got his PhD in 1987 from the University of British Columbia, a little bit after Nick. And currently your latest big thing is the uh, the Maple Transactions Journal yes. that you're yes. editor of, right? Yes. Uh, so hopefully you can tell us a bit about that around the coffee breaks, etc. But I'll give you the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marcus. Thank you very much for inviting me. And I for giving me the opportunity to say happy birthday to, to Nick. So I'll actually save the, the greetings to the end. The fact of the this gathering brings such a wide cross section of people in uh, linear algebra, not just numerical linear algebra, but, but theoretical linear algebra as well, is really a wonderful opportunity for me to try to recruit you to Team Bohemia. So I, I, as you can see that we have uh, uh, Team Bohemian is already well established at uh, Manchester. This is a this image was created by my former student Stephen Thornton, and the very first Bohemian workshop was held here in 2018, or co-organized by Nick and myself, uh, and sponsored by the Royal Society at Heilbronn as as well for that. So uh, since then we've had workshops at Siam and at ITM. Um, I will talk to you at the coffee break about organizing the one for ILAS in Madrid. Uh, Freiland wants us to do it, so I think we should do a Bohemian workshop in, in uh, Madrid. Um, so I really do want to recruit you to Team Bohemian. Um, okay, what, what's it all about? Um, no, one of these things works. Advance, no, that's the... Ah. There we go. I was going to hide the thing again now that I saw this. Here is somebody um, monitoring the uh, uh, Zoom chat for questions. Maybe some questions. Oh, thank you very much. I will need to click on here. Yeah. Well, I want to go backwards. Thank you for mentioning Maple Transactions. Maple Transactions is an open access journal with no page charges. So really, really free. Um, I want to encourage you to submit items that would be of interest to the Maple community, which is actually fairly wide, fairly broad. Uh, we're particularly interested in applications, uh, uh, things right now. We're also are interested in educational work or research in algorithms, including algorithms in linear algebra. The first two issues have very interesting papers, uh, one by Nick Trefethen and Peter Badu, uh, which I highly recommend that you have a look at. Uh, Peter Badu actually did a video abstract for the, the thing, which is really well worth watching. And uh, in, in the same issue, we have a paper by Richard Brent called Some Instructive Mathematical Errors. And it's really fabulous. Um, one of his colleagues said, oh yes, this is, this is Richard Brent's paper full of mistakes. Well, <laughs> it, it's a lovely, uh, I, I can't say any more, more about it. So. Student papers are especially welcome. We have a, a, a session for students. Now I can do several things here with this, one, but I, let's stick to the actual control. This is a cartoon by John DePillis, which was, you know, all the speakers hang out over there. You know, let's go over and, and hang out over here for a little bit. So Nick's, I think this was your final column in, as president in Siam News, had this uh, a wonderful cartoon. So they, the column was rhapsodizing about bohemian matrices. And I just love this, right? You know, so bohemian matrices, they have more fun. Great. What is a bohemian matrix? So the name comes from a mnemonic, bounded height matrix of integers. Okay, bohemian, that's close enough. That's, that's good enough. Well, what's, what's the height of a matrix? Am I allowed to use chalk? I guess I am. Um, height of A is defined to be the infinity norm of vector A. Great. So of course, now you all know that that makes it actually a, a matrix norm. It's not a submultiplicative matrix norm. The height of AB is not necessarily less than the height of A times the height of B, but you get a lot from that. Largest the absolute value entry in it what on earth does minimizing the height or bounding the height do for you? Strange things, it turns out. Um, of course, such things have been studied 
for a very long time, just not under the name. The name was invented in 2015 and first appeared in print in 2016. So, well, and now we have a cartoon and a calendar, all kinds of things. So it's a real field. So we, we have this. Um, we have a Wikipedia entry. Well, I wrote it. <laughs> um, but, it's, you know, there, there it is. Uh, see the London Math Society newsletter, November 2020. So uh, Nick and Stephen Thornton and I contributed that, that cover image, and we have a one-page description in there. By the way, my slides all have links. So if you go to the GitHub repository and download the slides, you now have links to all of these things. Why we're interested, there's lots of reasons to be interested in these kinds of things once you notice them as a thing. There's lots of applications that come up. Our original interest was pure software testing. So Stephen has a kind of claim, slightly facetious, but I think it's probably true, of having solved more eigenvalue problems than anyone else in the world. He solved several trillion eigenvalue problems, which is okay. But this is a different dimension. We're not solving trillion by trillion matrices. We're solving five by five matrices, just trillions of them. Well, billions of five by fives. You get into trillions when you go to, six, or 10 to the 17th when you go to six by six. We did uncover places where uh, MATLAB's QR algorithm failed to converge. Cleve quite correctly maintained that that was not a bug because there was no theorem proving convergence for, but now there is. So how many have heard of the, the result from Berkeley that the, they managed to figure out how to, prove that the QR algorithm always converges? Yeah, some, there we go. So, but no, it's not as widely known as I, th as I think it should be, but it's a, it, this is cool. Uh, we also found a bug in Maple's F-solve. So it's solving polynomial equations with the same approach. And that was a degree three polynomial with complex coefficients, but still. Okay, but that got fixed right away. Uh, software testing is a real reason to do this stuff. But one, anyway, it's not the only reason. There's lots more stuff. Um, Nick used them to improve uh, bounds on the growth factor. Uh, we were looking at uh, uh, correlation matrices. Matthew is doing fun stuff with uh, magic squares. Uh, Nick Trefethen made the connection between us and David Nelson at Harvard, who uses these uh, uh, non-Hermitian quantum mechanics, which I had never heard of before, which is kind of cool. But he's got uh, images that are exactly the same as, as some of the images in my work on skew symmetric tridiagonal bohemians. Um, we've got some simple results in linear algebra and applications uh, on upper Hessenberg and upper Hessenberg Toplitz matrices. So that, this is only the second mention of Toplitz matrices today. But thank you very much, Andy, for the other one. And I mentioned the calendar as well. So you can find the calendar on my website. So. Why are they interesting theoretically? They're interesting theoretically because they're both a generalization and a specialization. They're a generalization of things like Bernoulli matrices or zero one matrices. Um, and they specialize generalized general matrices. So you can, you're looking at a subset of things and the subset actually can tell you a lot about what's going on. George Polia, oh yes. Congratulations, Nick, on winning the Polio Prize in 2021. Um, all right, what, did, what is this talk about? I want to tell you that we can actually prove interesting things using uh, Bohemian matrices or interesting things about Bohemian matrices. So to tell you that there are things, easy things to do, easy things to, to solve. So. Um, Max solved one of the con conjectures uh, uh, about Bohemian matrices. There are problems that are open right now, but might not be next week because of you, because of the pool of different expertises that's in this room. So here's what uh, uh, we managed to prove recently. I managed to prove a theorem, a new theorem about Toplitz matrices really, given how much there's known about Toplitz matrices, but it really seems to be a new theorem about Toplitz matrices, which explains why we see a Sierpinski gasket in this picture. What is this picture? This is a zooming in on a density plot of eigenvalues 
of upper Hessenberg, zero diagonal, and the, the lower subdiagonal all has minus ones. And everything above the main diagonal is cube roots of unity. This is not a random selection of them. This is all of them. We took all of those matrix, what dimension? Uh, dimension 13. So 13 by 13 matrices are not very big, but when you have three possible entries for all of the upper super triangle, you get half a million matrices in there. All right, that's a lot of matrices. And you plot them and you see these triangles and they look like Sierpinski gaskets. Is that just pareidolia? Is this something that we're, that we're seeing that isn't there or can we prove it? And the answer is we can prove it. And the details are in the, the paper um, which is on the archive, but it's actually the paper in the, in the proceedings of the ISAC conference, which is running right now. <laughs> and I gave a talk yesterday at ISAC on this subject. What we did was we extended the Schmidt-Spitzer theorem. In this audience, I expect about a third of the audience to know the Schmidt-Spitzer theorem for Toplitz matrices. Uh, can I have a survey? How many know Schmidt-Spitzer from 1963? Oh, oh, okay. Maybe I knew something that, that, that I had to learn about it. So the um, I learned about Toplitz matrices and pseudospectra from Mark Embry and, and Nick Trefethen's work, of course. And you see these wonderful, beautiful pictures. Uh, you compute eigenvalues of, of Toplitz matrices and as the dimension gets bigger, they get really, really more sensitive. And the, it turns out that the pseudospectra are more like the spectra of the infinite dimensional operators. But for at low dimensions, low enough dimensions where you can compute the eigenvalues accurately, the, eigenval the eigenvalues actually cling to some semi-algebraic curves, at least in, in certain circumstances, if the symbol is, what's the symbol? What's the symbol? Um, Banded Toplitz matrices are pretty easy. So if you, everything is zero from there and everything is zero over there, you only have a finite number of things up and along the side. Then the symbol is just, these are the Fourier coefficients, or if you like the Laurent series coefficients of these things, thinking in complex variables, and it's just a polynomial. All right. Uh, Schmidt and Spitzer in 1963 proved a lovely theorem about eigenvalues of Toplitz matrices of this sort as the dimension goes to infinity. And they proved that the eigenvalues cluster on certain algebraic curves, semi-algebraic curves actually. Um, classical theory about all of these things, this is the Schmidt and Spitzer theory. And I hope that I've, got the right curve, uh, where's, there we go. So here, the, the, the image of the unit circle under, uh, under the symbol gives you the area where the pseudospectra live. This curve here, joined with this one, joined with this one, joined with this one, joined with this one, are things you, you can find by solving univariate polynomial equations. There's a new algorithm by Butcher and Gaska uh, and another author, author whose name I, I forget, but that improved the algorithm a little bit. It's very simple to implement. And my implementation is at the, at the uh, in Maple at the repository that I mentioned. And you can see already, even at dimension six, the eigenvalues of this particular matrix are pretty close to that curve. The problem with the banded system is it really was only um, for, for Laurent polynomials, not for Laurent series. Well, we seem to be the first people to look at letting the top fill in, but not the bottom with a bounded height. So the entries in the symbol are a bounded size, even out here. And in that case, you actually get convergent series convergent power series, and then you can use classical theorems. And in that case, these Schmidt-Spitzer curves, as you add more and more terms to them, they actually converge. And so you get convergence. So the eigenvalues of, of these matrices, as you add more terms to them, they converge to these little curves. They're, con they're constrained to be there. All right, what's that got to do with the, the Sierpinski gasket thing? 
Well, every time you add another entry, every time, so suppose we have our toplets matrix here, every time you add another dimension, you're adding another entry out in the far right hand side. And if your population is cube roots of unity, that new thing could be one of three things. So each of those matrices um, has, you get three new eigenvalues essentially for each old one. And they're constrained by this convergence theorem to be near this curve. That curve is different depending on all the previous choices, but you've made all of them. So you've got all of these different curves lying around, but each old eigenvalue just generates three new ones nearby. Oh, that's exactly the Sierpinski construction. So we have managed to explain this image by an actual theorem and a talk to some toplets matrix experts that they did not seem to know this extension. They did, I thought, oh wait, <laughs> this does seem to be a new theorem. I searched the literature, just as you said, <laughs> it's so hard to know what, what's new and, and what isn't. Um, there's details of what the Schmidt-Spitzer theorem uh, is, and you can look at that, and that's what we proved. Um, that's what we explained. Help! This, I have no idea why this picture looks the way it is. This is no longer toplets matrices. This is unstructured matrices. I've just chosen the population minus one plus or minus I. So there are only two possible entries in every entry in there. So this is dimension M equals seven. I only sampled 5 million matrices, but if we do more of them, you get pretty much the same picture. I can kind of explain the holes. I have no idea why there are two blobs. I can kind of explain the funny little magnetic lines in there. They are actually to do something uh, Kate Sang and Edmund Harris, they called algebraic star starscapes. So the, that's pareidolia. So what is happening is those discrete eigenvalues lie on algebraic curves and they stop. And we are picking up where they stop and we draw the lines where they stop, which is our, our visual cortex does some draw, drawing lines in there. That's only a partial explanation, but it's kind of, it's wild. So where's the origin? Uh, origin is here. Um, it is not. Uh, although, you know, if it was, it would only be, uh, the dot would be just so small that we wouldn't see it on this one. It's a density plot of, of eigen, eigenvalues. Why do I have like flames shooting out of that? <laughs> no idea. So please help on there. Um, there are combinatorial open problems. Uh, the number of characteristic polynomials in that giant collection of matrices. So it, uh, at dimension one, oh great, uh, if the population is plus or minus uh, one, then this is the Bernoulli case. There's only two one by one matrices, characteristic polynomials, okay, we can do that. We can do two by two, three by three, four by four, five by five, six by six, but there's 10 billion matrices. And to find out that there's only 131,000 characteristic polynomials in that, you have to compute them all and compare them. I don't know any other way to do that. If the population is minus one plus or minus I, like that picture that I just showed you, we haven't done the, the computation with 10 billion in there. I'm not sure that it would help, but whatever it is, it, so 33 million gives us 65,000 characteristic polynomials. We don't know. Anybody who's interested in combinatorics can help us out with that as well. These are, if you look up on the online encyclopedia of integer sequences, you will find that right column. Neil Sloan was in one of my talks on Bohemian matrices and he wrote them all down and they we went. So thanks Neil for that. Um, more on Bohemians, there's a, for those following on Zoom, if I walked out of the picture, what that's okay, we have, uh, there's a longer version of this on my YouTube channel. You can find a, a related talks by uh, looking at Bohemians. My new book, I'm so happy. Computational Discovery on Jupiter with Neil Kalkin and Eunice Chen. Eunice Chen sends her birthday greetings. Uh, 
Uh, it's just been accepted by Siam, so the print version of this will be uh, a Siam book, and I, I joined the cool kids who published with Siam. So uh, you can find more that way. Thank you very much. Lots of people were were involved, including some of the people in the audience. But happy birthday, Nick. Question. Yeah, so I think for the plot that you showed, the, the mysterious plot, uh, using random Mesh theory, at least in the limit, you should be able to explain it to C, because if I understand correctly, that rank one plus Bernoulli times something, right? So I'm uh, this, this does help us to understand a, at least one other one. So I would like to do, to do something like that. Uh, but Random matrix theory, so the wonderful paper by Tao and Vu, for the general unstructured thing, you get a uniform distribution on a disk. And here we have two blocks. So yeah, but you, you, I think you can do it. Okay. I, I, this, by the end of today, I want to see the, at least a sketch, okay? <laughs> Welcome. If it fails, that I, I guess you could also interpret in a random matrix theory kind of thing, kind of way, by sure. looking at the limit. And to this aspect of distribution, is it the same? It's, it's the same thing. It's exactly the same thing. Yeah. yeah. In, that, in that case, and you, just the question of whether you're thinking, well, you always think about the entire universe of what you're sampling from anyway. And that's really, it really is the same thing. So that's. So what can you see if this triangle thing, if you replace the cube roots by four roots, would you get to see if it's decarbon? Yes. And and we have several pictures uh, of exactly that. This is fifth roots. That's a picture. So Bohemian swag is a real thing. Um, so uh, we have at the, the 2018 workshop. There's a picture, I guess, up on the the website of the 2018 workshop of everybody wearing their t-shirts from the Bohemian and with the doubly companion images. So that's a different that's a different thing. But yes, uh, it with only plus or minus one, it's hard to see. The doubling, but it's there. Uh, with four, you very definitely get uh, squares of squares of squares of squares of things showing up. But it's nonlinear, so they get deformed and and moved around. Um, I think I tweeted one of my good images of that. Yeah, Pierce. Um, I'm just curious. If you uh, remove minus one, do you lose the blob? Then the answers would just be plus or minus one. Um, I didn't try it. I don't know. I didn't try it. But I, by the end of today, let's let's find out. <laughs> the, the code, uh, it's so that in our uh, open educational resource, computational discovery, that, that has a, actually a lot of Python code for doing these kinds of things. And I have a Maple version for doing that. So we could actually take that code and run it today and find out with the different it's fields. I'm curious because you said the one on the left. Has, one, has to have something to do with the minus one. Yeah. That is, I, I don't know the scale on this. This is plus or minus seven. Uh, that's zero there. That's about minus seven. So the dimension is coming in on there by the Bendixson theorem, which uh, Nick taught me about. Bendixson, Bromwich, Hirsch. There, and I just learned from James Davenport that Bromwich is spelled without a T. Anyway, <laughs> that's fine. So it's quite possible that the two uh, black dots within the third world in Europe is one I'd like to try. Yeah, it's, uh, making up a population to make new images for for talks is very easy, but then you get questions like these: and "Why didn't you do that?" So yeah, I should do that. Stefan, so when you generate these pictures, do you actually use Ike and call it like five million times, or any tricks involved? This is yeah. the right question to ask in this audience. So right now, we do not do very many tricks at all. Um, my biggest, my personal biggest computation was done in Julia, and I actually <laughs> reduced it down to recurrence equation for the characteristic polynomials, and was counting the characteristic polynomials so I knew how many uh, things were were singular at, at, at that. So to ignore to 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 get multiple roots right, you actually have to work with the characteristic polynomials, 
in this way because otherwise you know mm. um but i really want to try to take as much advantage of uh well gpu if i can uh technology to do the eigenvalues things as fast as i as as i can because even for six by six the population has three entries in it you are already exascale you got 10 to the 17th matrices to deal with and yeah so we do a lot with i but sometimes when we're counting characteristic polynomials or counting things then we are doing exact computation but i guess we could start an individual matrix and subtract it through the qr iteration right if you just rescale after every step because you yeah. keep it all integer um or if the dimension is small enough yes but uh, and at the, the point at the point at where the you kind of blow the bounds we haven't figured that out yet because we don't under oh characteristic height is the size of the maximum coefficient in the characteristic polynomial and we don't have good bounds on those and that actually generalizes the Hadamard conjecture you try to maximize the determinant try and maximize the the coefficient in the characteristic polynomial it's a new thing of uh, 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 people who are studying how to mark matrix oh that's an interesting problem so oh, this fun kind of stuff and, and it matters in practice for this kind of thing and if you can compress so much maybe we should be thinking about characteristic polynomials but i don't know how you can get all of them unless you look all because because not everything that fits in the bounds is going to be a characteristic polynomial for some bohemian matrix and that brings up the minimal height companion matrix problem which is a different problem but you can tell that there's lots to go on in here another question no. yes, well, maybe i'll ask a question then uh, so the bunny the first thing that bunny said was about random matrices uh, being applicable to it have you had any interest from you know, actual random matrix theory people um, some and what so so for matrix? instance david nelson thinks about the random matrices uh as well and of course, the, the, the techniques from random matrix theory are applicable to understanding some of these things, but I'm trying to learn about probability by doing exhaustive computations, and so I'm just taking baby steps towards random matrix theory at the moment. But that is very much a huge and active area. Uh, one of the referees for this paper in ISAC knew a lot about it and had pointed out some really, really useful references for, for me on, on this as well. Trying to find out what's in the literature is impossible without multiple eyes. Let's thank Rob for taking. Thank you very much, Peter.